I played Ultima 6 a long time ago, but I never got to finish it, and I've always wanted to go back to it, so I was pretty thrilled that Exalt did a remake of Ultima 6 in the Ultima 7 engine. I hadn't intended on playing through it all the way, but I got hooked. Before I knew it, I gathered the 8 runes and I couldn't stop. I compiled the treasure map and suddenly I was at the endgame. I really enjoyed taking Ultima 6 to the finish line and these are my thoughts on the game from the Exalt remake. In part, this is an expansion of a video I made not too long ago, sharing my thoughts on the first part of the game, so if you've seen that one, you may see some similar footage. And just a warning, there's going to be story spoilers throughout. Ah, the good old days when being an avatar meant standing for virtue. Doing what was right was challenging but also rewarding. The Avatar helped bring enlightenment to the people of Britannia in Ultima 4, Quest of the Avatar. Or so we thought. In Ultima 5, those virtues were totally corrupted by Blackthorn. Fortunately, the Avatar defeated the Shadow Lords and Blackthorn to re-establish peace. His reward? A life of loneliness. Insomnia keeps him up at night, it doesn't look like he has any friends or loved ones in his life either. So when the possibility of going back comes up again, he's eager to rush in, but he hesitates. The gates are usually blue, but this time, it's a foreboding red. Isolation can make a person desperate, and the avatar rushes in, only to find himself surrounded by a whole lot of monsters. The Exalt team did a great job recreating the entire opening of Ultima 6 with the in-game engine. I think it really brings it to life in a really interesting way, because there's no separation from the in-game assets with the cutscene ones. It makes the story feel more seamless. I love the fact that Ultima follows the action of one character throughout an entire series. I'm trying to think if there's any other series that do that. Final Fantasy generally has a different plot and all new characters with each new entry. It's, I think it's the same with Dragon Quest, uh, Breath of Fire. I mean, they might have some ties from a historical perspective, but generally it's a whole new cast. Maybe Yis is the only RPG I can think of because all the games are about Adol. But even then, his adventures take him to different areas. Whereas in the Ultima games, we're playing as the Avatar and watching how the Avatar's actions impact Britannia throughout the centuries. Old friends come to the rescue, the Avatar escapes, but a few gargoyles follow. Unfortunately for the team, I've forgotten the keyboard command for attack. Uh, what was it? I'm trying to click here. And I died. For anyone curious, it's C on the keyboard for combat similar to Ultima 7. Britannia is under attack by gargoyles. They have been coming up through the dungeons. The whole question of why the gargoyles are attacking is the mystery at the center of the game. If this were a typical RPG, we might attribute it to them simply being a force of evil that wants to destroy the good represented by the Avatar. The answer is a lot more complicated than that, though Lord British doesn't seem to be aware of any deeper issues. At this early stage, Lord British makes sure his mission seems simple. Stop the evil gargoyles at all costs and liberate the eight shrines representing the eight virtues. It's not very different from your typical fantasy game setup where the monsters represent evil like in the Lord of the Rings, especially considering the gargoyles just try to kill you. I do quickly want to point out a few things about the Exalt remake that I really like. I really like the updates on the way you interact with the NPCs way better. Just having the Ultima 7 style of dialogue makes it easier to focus on the story and the characters. It's pretty cool that they're using the sprites from Ultima 7, but the face portraits are from Ultima 6. I think this was the first time the series had portraits, and the art style is uh, very distinct. I think I definitely prefer the Ultima 7 style inventory over the Ultima 6 one as it makes inventory management much easier. One lesson I learned from Ultima 7 is to only pick up things I absolutely need, as there's just so much junk lying around. It feels like Ultima 6 tries to recreate Ultima Force Quest again and its game loop. Learn the mantras, get the runes, and place them on the shrines. But circumstances have changed a whole lot. This is the first time you get to see the actual impact of your actions on the Britannians without Blackthorn to corrupt them. How did the Avatar do? Let's visit the cities and find out. And the first NPC I meet outside the castle is a con artist claiming to be Lord British. 
a false king to accompany a false prophet. What's surprising is this grifter is pulling an obvious swindle, but he's not afraid of getting caught, even though he's literally outside the castle walls. As Britannia is a city that is dedicated to the virtue of compassion, should we as the Avatar show compassion and give him money despite knowing he's lying? But on that note, is the very compassion we represent the reason why he feels he can defraud people so casually without consequences? One of Ultima 6's more interesting dichotomies is that the opening prologue with its really grim and ominous tone contrasts completely with the first main quest to liberate the shrines. I'll highlight what I like about each quest and how the game often takes an unexpected approach to the virtues in their respective towns. In Jellum, which represents Valor, the mayor tells you that the rune is given to the winner of a tournament to prove who is most valorous. I expected some kind of trial or combat so the avatar could prove to be the most valorous. But no, the winner, Nomen, reveals that he dropped the rune and a rat stole it. Now, if you want the rune, you have to track this rat down, but this isn't some super monster rat that you have to fight to prove your courage. A waitress tells you it's hidden inside a hole in their pub. The way you obtain the rune is to recruit Sherry the Mouse from Lord British's castle by offering her cheese, take Sherry back to the city, and have her steal the rune back. Talk about valor. Sherry also gets you cheese and a ring of invisibility. I actually wonder if there's anyone who's beaten the game using only Sherry. Actually, I just googled it and it looks like she can get very powerful if you take the time to level her up, so have at it, mouse avatars. In the case of you, the execution of justice seems overly zealous. The mayor, Lenora, has some guy locked up in a stockade. The prison where the thief, Boskin, is imprisoned has a bunch of kids in a cell. What'd they do? Boskin reveals he dug up the Rune of Justice from the Lord Mayor's grave. When you ask him about it, he lies about having robbed the grave to feed his family. I thought maybe it was a miscarriage of justice. But the Mayor tells you Boskin is a con artist too and when you confront him with the truth, he reveals the location of the Rune is under a potted plant at the local pub. Oddly, this is the second Rune you find in a pub. You is also where I get my first new party member. Welcome Janna, it's been a long time. In Ultima 7 she'd relocated to Cove, but it's nice to see her back in you again where I first met her when she was a druidist for Ultima 4. Wait, so I'm here in Trinzig, the city dedicated to honor, and the rune is just out here with no guards? Is this the real one? Or is the town really making the rune part of an honor system? Found the mayor, and apparently he's so trusting of people, he doesn't care who takes it since he sincerely believes whoever took it would have enough honor to return it. I mean, can I even return it after I free the shrine? I can't find the rune in my bag anymore. I'm really, really sorry about that. I actually felt bad, so I tried going back to the mayor of Trinsic, but the dialogue doesn't reflect the fact that you've taken the rune, so I don't think I can do anything for now. I did find the guy who sells armor, though he isn't as trusting with the honor system. He's selling magic armor, so I gotta stock up. The story though, doesn't end there. I'm skipping ahead a bit, but it's connected to the virtue of honor. As it turns out, the mayor is a liar. He used to be a pirate named Alistair Gordon, and he came to Trinsic to start a new life. In this case, is it honorable that he lied about his past? He gives you a piece of the treasure map when you confront him with the truth, but I still wasn't sure what to think of his view of honor. It's weird coming to Skara Bray after Ultima 7 where it was completely destroyed. Here it's a normal city, except it's not. The mayor is a pompous fool who thinks he's spiritual. He insists you call him your honor. What is it with Skara Bray and their mayors? There's a murder afoot. Someone killed Quentin. Despite the city's reputation, I didn't see much spirituality in Scarabray aside from Quentin's ghost. And his spectral presence wasn't there because of some holy blessing. It's because he can't move on after what happened to him. Some of the people are blaming gargoyles, except it doesn't follow the usual pattern of gargoyle killings. 
I've researched it a little bit, but I'm not sure if there's a way to solve this mystery. I do recall that you do meet Quentin in Ultima 7, and a little outside Scholar Bray, I meet a suspicious guy who appears to be Quentin's killer. But as far as I know, there isn't any way of bringing him to justice. You get the rune from Quentin's daughter, and it's a touching scene when you realize his spirit left the rune for her. Except she has no idea, adding to the tragedy. It's sad talking to these people, knowing what fate awaits in their near future. I think the compassion rune has more meaning just because I played Seven first. This young girl, Ariana, has the rune and can give it to you if you get permission from her mom. I visit her mom at the pub and she gives her okay. The thing that's touching is you learn in Seven from her great-great-granddaughter that this brief, almost forgettable encounter had a huge impact on Ariana to the point where she pledged her life and her descendants to hold the shrine dear. Unfortunately, their family will suffer great tragedies because of this pledge. On a funny side note, this random NPC nearby Ariana starts talking about dreams and suddenly falls asleep. I have no idea what's going on or if she's part of a greater mission, but I've never had an NPC fall asleep on me in the middle of a conversation. Random moments like this are what I love about Ultima 6. I'm heading to New Magencia now to pick up another ruin. New Magencia is dedicated to the virtue of humility. The mayor challenges the avatar to take part in a competition to get the ruin. Who's the most humble person in the city? This is another case of the virtue being twisted, even if it's in a funny way. Charlotte tells me, Honesty is a virtue too, and honesty forces me to admit that I am the humblest person in Numigencia. Serving others, it the humblest occupation I could imagine. The answer is Connor, who is the only person to say they're not humble at all. Humble envy is a weird thing to witness. Honestly, of all the runes, the rune of honesty was my least favorite to get, mainly because it felt like a really long fetch quest where no one knows the full truth. In Moonglow, the Witch Penumbra knows where it's at, but to find out that information, you need to get a Dispel Field spell from the Mage Xiao. Dispel the room full of harmful magic, which honestly seems like an odd thing for a fortune teller to place in their welcoming foyer. She tells you to go down to the catacombs for the grave of her ex, search through some tombs only to realize some other guy is dropping daffodils there. Climb back up, get the key, Promise to leave a flower, then go back down and break in to grab the rune. Of course, now I gotta find the key in my bag. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I gotta move everything. This is why inventory management is so important in Ultima games. Ah, <laughs> there it is on the left side. Can't believe I missed that. Jumping in with a quick note, I left that in there because finding items is a common pain with Ultima 7. Fortunately, the K button in Exalt will automatically select the right key for you. Thank you, Exalt team. I enter the door and find Baven's corpse. He looks like he died a bloody death. But disturbingly, you never find out the truth. Honesty eludes you in the very town representing the virtue of honesty. Oh, and on the way out, you fight a bunch of grave robbers. Minoc feels totally different from the other cities. The mayor has heard about the gargoyles but hasn't seen any of them nearby. Despite the gravity of the situation, when the avatar asks about the rune of sacrifice, the avatar is referred to the artisans guild which you then have to join. But there's two conditions. You have to make a panpipe and then play the song Stones on it. To get the panpipe, you need wood from you. In you, you meet Big Ben. Big Ben is pretty hostile to you, and the reason why is because he thinks you're from Lord British. Not so long ago, he won a wood chopping competition, and ever since then, Lord British wants to recruit him for the war effort against the gargoyles. He refused to sacrifice himself for the greater good, but strangely, I actually respected him more for that. It actually made me wonder if I should start refusing some of Lord British's requests myself. I liberated the final shrine, but there's no moment of acknowledgement from the game. Even Lord British's dialogue doesn't update for the achievement. An anticlimactic moment that had more meaning when I accomplished the same thing in Ultima 4. Does anyone even care anymore? I became curious about the war effort against the gargoyles as I had seen so little trace of them within the cities themselves. In the Compassion Shrine, I saw a heap of human corpses. One soldier even looked like he'd been vaporized. I went over to Cove to meet the survivors and was 
horrified by what I saw. Soldiers were in tremendous pain, screaming in agony. Had I caused this suffering? This is me just conjecturing, but it seems like the designers wanted to question the virtues and their meaning to the people. It's done in a playful way that I think is both thoughtful and really clever. But after the events of Ultima 4, I'd hoped the Avatar could be a shining beacon. But if 5 represented a corruption of those ideals, I'd say 6 represents a trivialization of the virtues in light of the contrasting ones of other societies. Did your actions actually make Britannia a better place? The middle of the game is a treasure map hunt. Your old companion, Mariah, can translate the Book of Prophecies the Gargoyles held, but she needs the Silver Tablet. The tablet was split into two, and the second part was stolen by a pirate called Captain Hawkins, who hid it in a secret location. Some of the pieces require you to go into the dungeons to find them. I really like this part, and I'd say the dungeons are the one area where Ultima 6 holds a definite advantage over Ultima 7. Some of them have multiple levels and you have to do some navigating, like with the ant mound. Old Hawknose was killed by a bunch of ants. You find his body and a missing treasure map piece at the bottom floor near the Ant Queen. I enjoyed exploring dungeons overall, and it felt fun just looking around the labyrinthian complex. But the treasure hunt also exposes the underbelly of Britannia. Whether it's joining the Guild of Thieves, robbing one of its members of her belt to get initiated yourself, or just hanging out with the pirates, the virtues have their limits. If you'd followed the creeds established by the Avatar, it'd be difficult if not impossible to find the map. Finding most of the map pieces doesn't require you to be virtuous. You don't save anyone, even when you try. I already mentioned Hawknose and Atmount. In the dungeon Shame, you find a pirate, Yabara, who's starving. But no matter how much food you give him, he's never satisfied. If you stop giving him food, he faints, and you end up just leaving him there. On Dagger Isle, you find Bon, who lost his mind after killing Captain Hawkins. Again, there's nothing you can do for him. You raid his place and steal his map, and then move on. Probably one of the most disturbing quests on a personal level was when Captain Hawkins' old chef, Sandy, asks you to bring a dragon egg from Dungeon Distard in exchange for information about some of the treasure maps. For the most part, I hadn't engaged with dragons in the game. To enter their nest, steal an egg, and massacre a bunch of dragons just so I could get Sandy an ingredient from to make for a special dish felt wrong. Of course, this is all just a build up to the big reveal. Once you get the entire treasure map, find the second half of the silver tablet and have Mariah translate the Book of Prophecies. You learn the gargoyles were justified in their actions. You as the Avatar destroyed their world in Ultima 4. While it's arguable who actually took the codex from its original position, since Ultima 6 began, I've killed a whole lot of gargoyles at the shrines. I think this revelation is all the more poignant because of what you see in Britannia. Honestly, the world pre-quest of the Avatar in Ultima 4 and the one post-quest of the Avatar in Ultima 6 seem more or less the same. There's still a lot of poverty, still a lot of crime, and still a whole lot of pirates. But your actions nearly caused the destruction of an entire civilization. The gargoyles came for you only because they wanted to fight off extinction. To that end, you rarely see the gargoyles in the towns themselves. Despite fighting for their survival, they leave the citizens alone. Their targets are the Avatar, the Shrines, and any soldiers who've attacked them. Their three main principles, control, passion, and diligence, are guiding them in this direction. Within the world of Britannia, there are a variety of memorable NPCs like a two-headed pony that speaks in riddles, a giant cyclops stomps around Stonegate and wants some fish to eat, a mortician is doing strange things with bodies, and has a secret room, which is disturbing to see. He is fighting with his assistant, the gravedigger Mole, who needs a new shovel so he can dig up bodies faster. These and more make the world feel more real and strange. When you finally reach the world of the gargoyles, it's shocking how important the codex is to their lifestyle. They take their creeds much more seriously than the Britannians do their virtues. Honestly, if you took away the code from Britannia, I don't think it'd make much of a difference. Ultima 7 proves that because the whole code is being replaced by the Fellowship 
In the case of the gargoyles, their whole lifestyle is destroyed and never recovered. Even in Ultima 7, they're still not able to re-establish what they had before the events of 6. I do appreciate that the Avatar acknowledges his role in all of this and rather than fight it, he accepts it and sacrifices himself. The final stretch of the game isn't about preparing to fight some supervillain, some ultra gargoyle or even some guardian-like enemy pulling the strings from behind the scenes. It's about the Avatar making atonement, facing his past, and trying to bridge the two races. I really like the fact that the Avatar speaks with the villains of the first three games in the series. They regard him with respect, have a thoughtful conversation with him, and help him to understand their guiding beliefs and virtues in a very different light. To the gargoyles, the original villains were the heroes, while you were the evil that stood against everything they held sacred. The fact that even despite all the destruction you caused, they give you a way to save yourself, is a testament to them. I spoke with Richard Garriott a few years back for a Kotaku article, and he told me, What I tried to show in Ultima 6 was that racism is learned. We all carry assumptions about things around us, about what and how we perceive the world. Far too many perpetual conflicts in the world are sustained generation after generation due to these deeply held beliefs and grudges that prevent any real progress from being made. Honestly, I don't know how we are going to solve this in the real world, but I think it's important to play out in a fictional world so we think about it. In Ultima 6, the Avatar learns to embrace virtues outside of his own and realizes the limitations that they have. The same codex is being interpreted very differently by the races, dogmatically trying to apply the Britannian interpretation of a moral code to the gargoyles can have disastrous effects and lead to major misunderstandings and conflict. One of my favorite lines from the film Dark Knight is when Harvey Dent says, you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Only by becoming the villain does the Avatar expand his definition of what it means to be a hero. Only by subverting his moral code does he transcend them to become something more than just the Avatar. What that is though is left unresolved in the game and left to the player to decide themselves. Just like in 7, Ultima 6 has me thinking about religion. Most religions have a figure like the Avatar who started it all, but many religions also have had terrible things done in their name. It's a very sad commentary on human nature that something so good can become so twisted. I don't know why it took me so long to play the game, but I'm super grateful to the Exalt team for creating this remake. I'd love to hear from anyone who's played the original versus the remake how they feel about the game and how faithful it is to the original. Based on the research I've done, it seems like a really good way to experience the game. I know some people don't love the real-time combat of Ultima 7, but for me, I'm not playing Ultima games for their combat, so I don't have strong feelings one way or another on that. Regardless of which one you do play, I think the game story is fantastic and highly recommend you try it out. For me, it's a mixed feeling finally completing False Prophet. Every Ultima game I play means one less new Ultima I can experience. I'm down to Serpent's Isle, Ultima 8 and 9, and I've heard enough about 8 and 9 to temper expectations, but I'm glad Serpent's Isle awaits. So thank you so much if you've listened all the way through. See you next time, Avatar.